So what well, do you guys think about that? Let me ask you guys. Let me ask you yeah. guys. So obviously with Orgy in and Davis Warren out, it's probably going to, you know, the the the, the needle's going to move more toward the run, but Orgy's going to have to throw, right? To keep yes. to keep the box light, to keep USC from just ganging up uh, at the line of scrimmage. So what do you what do you think in terms of sequencing? You know, for I I always like to get into first down, second down, you know. Do you try and establish the run on first and 10, or do you throw the six yard pass on first down to try and get into second and short, medium, manageable? Uh, it's going to be a balancing act because obviously if Michigan can pound the ball for five yards on first down, like that's that's the ideal. But you might have to be throwing on first down at least early in this game in the first quarter to lighten up that tackle box and keep USC guessing. So how do you think the Michigan staff sequences its plays first second down so unfortunately i think we're going to be predictable i really do and the reason why i say that is because we have not seen any creativity of this of our of our of our scheme of our play calling yet we've actually seen our coaches put our players so far this season in positions where it kills momentum they make very poor choices uh now it does appear though they are committing to a quarterback so we won't see this dual quarterback uh, juggling they were doing earlier in the year against Texas and uh, Fresno State. But my concern, so what I think what we will see on first down, uh, do your prop bets, do whatever, they're running the ball. They're running the ball on first down. You can just, if, if we see, create, I'll tell you this though, if we do see creativity out of the coaching staff and they start doing some play action or uh, some nice, you know, short to immediate roll or even you know, some rollouts, some strong RPOs, then we're talking, but I just haven't seen it this year, guys. Like, just that's where we are. Like, right now, uh, I think the fan base, as well as myself, uh, our trust in the coaching staff is a bit dwindled at the moment, and we're just in observation mode trying to understand, uh, are they in over their heads on some of this? Because, although I will say this, obviously, Stromo was offensive coordinator last year. He coordinated a championship-caliber offense. He got the job done, but we are not seeing that creativity this year at all. Like, what we did against Alabama, now, again, Orgy is a different quarterback than JJ, so it's a bit different. Uh, you know, you have to go with different strategies here. But at the same time, the creativity has been lacking. Uh, and, and the feel for the game has been lacking. So it's, it's a bit of a concern on Michigan's end right now. Yeah, two words. Uh, read option. Um, what I want to happen versus what I think is going to happen are two very different things. I think what I think is going to happen is read option over and over and over and over again. Sometimes it goes to orgy. Sometimes it's mullings. Maybe you get lucky and, and there's a uh, on maze madman last night. We talked about a, a running back screen uh, that we haven't seen in a long since last year's team with quorum. So there are some things that I think they might go with. Uh, a lot of it depends on if Colston Loveland is fully healthy, to be honest with you, because Colston Loveland, um, I don't know if y'all have been playing college football 25, or even if you've just watched Colston, um, out of everybody in the pass game, he is the one player that consistently gets separation, that consistently is an, is an obvious option for whoever's the quarterback. And you could you could talk about the other receivers and tight ends as much as you want, but if he's healthy and playing, I think that's when you start to see things open up a little bit because because he can even with Alex Orgy not being the best passer, he can catch the ball with and with pretty much. I think if, if any of if some of us go out there, um, we we might be able to throw the ball successfully to Colston Loveland. He's that good. He's he's six five. Uh, so I think that he's a big factor. Um, I want to get your guys' take on that too, but I do want to thank Moose because Moose just gifted five uh, uh, memberships. So congratulations to Philip Buford, Jason Bode, oh. Keegan Imhoff, Les Austin, and Tez. Nice. All of you just got those who stay will be champions memberships for 30 days. Congratulations. And thanks to Moose for once again uh, being the Oprah and uh, and giving out some memberships for everybody. Um, really appreciate you, man. And and I hope everybody enjoys their membership. Um, but but yeah, like let, I want to kind of dive into the defense. And and we've talked a little bit about this on Conquest Call-In Show. I think I asked this question, either called in or asked this question. Um, but we kind of diving into it, it's only been one off season. However, unlike with Ohio State, unlike with 
um, other, other programs that have implemented a new defensive system, defensive coordinator. Something remarkable has happened here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you your flowers. Um, all of a sudden, USC has a, at least a top 40 defense when they did have a lot, not so, not so much. Let's be real. Let's be real. Um, they can tackle now. Like, t- like, like players can tackle. Um, player, there is this, there is, there are things that he's doing. I'd love to just get your takes on, you know, maybe a factor of, from each of you or two factors from each of you on what he's implemented, um, that has caused, uh, USC to actually create, um, you know, stops and, and cause third down stops and fourth down stops and all that good stuff. Well, um, so, so the issue is not really the tackling, and, and it's not the players. It, last year, it was really a scheme issue, and I think that Lincoln Riley did a good job talking about this uh, uh, after practice, saying that it's amazing. You know, when you see better tackling, it's not necessarily better technique, although they have been. Uh, you know, I've watched them. There, there's been a lot of emphasis on tackling at practice, but it's really just having guys in position to make plays. You know, you can have a great athlete out there, put them in a bad position. And then they got to make a tackle against a division one athlete. I mean, I don't know if anyone ever here has tried to tackle someone out in open space. It's, it's not one of the easiest things in the entire world to do. Placing your team in a position to be successful is one of the biggest things that have changed. Another thing that's happened is, is uh, you've seen the evolution of, of the coaching and, and the development. So that, that is a big portion of, of the tackling. Um, it's clearly an evident. It's been a, an emphasis for them to get more physical and to work on their tackling. But Riley really downplayed that part of it. He really just said, you know what? The guys are in position. They're making plays. I, 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 maybe his nicest way he could say that last year, they didn't know what the hell they were doing. And um, going back, if we could, though, go, going back to you guys talked about, um, about Colston. Um, uh, is there any word on him? Because he, here's the thing. I'm wondering if they're going to a more of a run game because you got your, your best receiver now questionable. I'm, I'm sure he's going to play. But we all know also, just because he's going to suit up and play doesn't mean he's at 100%. And if you're right. a receiver, you kind of need that arm. Uh, do, you guys, do you have any idea? Like, I'm sure TJ's watched the film. Do you know what's actually probably injured? Is it shoulder, elbow, wrist? What is it? So I don't know what's injured. but uh, So apparently the injury is less severe than anticipated. And he, the speculation is he may play this weekend. They don't know. Right? It hasn't been confirmed yet. So he may play. I mean, obviously, this is a major game. So if he's going to play or if he can play, he will play. I would I would expect that. But I don't know the word. I know we have it here. We'll see. Hogan Hansen's going to get an expanded role. That's yeah. the backup uh, to the F-type tight end. I mean, yeah. I would also anticipate more Marlon Klein. We started to see him last week. There's been a lot of hype out of him out of camp. Um, but, yeah, I mean, listen, if, 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 if he can't play, then our most dynamic offensive threat, is eliminated, which is a major problem for us. So, uh, and plus with a quarterback like Alex Orgy, a tight end is one of the best matches you can have. So we'll see. I mean, I would say it appears it's like a 60, 70% chance he'll play. It appears, but I mean, it's so early to know it's only Tuesday, so we don't know yet. I know. Hey, drugs are great. And if it's a pain thing, you can play through it. Drugs are wonderful. But, but again, (laughs) at, at some point, you know, if if you are injured and you're receiving quarterback, um, I mean, receiving a, a tight end, it's, right, it's right. again a question. I I thought right away again when I heard Orgy was the call, I kind I kind of scratched. It. I know, I, I know that that uh, ball security's been an, an issue, but at the same time, you know, isn't there a reason why you know um, Alex Orgy wasn't named the starting quarterback uh, nope. behind multiple quarterbacks during during the season? So. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I see a lot of optimism. I, I'm, I'm, nope. I'm, I am listening sure. to you guys, uh-huh. but I, I'm uh-huh. wondering. I'm wondering. You know, what is it that you've got you so optimistic about? Oh. Because we know how a one-dimensional. If you go one-dimensional against a, 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 a in modern defenses, it's really tough unless you have a super elite offense. Like maybe your offensive line last year could probably right. lean and, and do it, but with a questionable offensive line, seemingly going towards a run-heavy offense, one-dimensional. What what is the what is the avenue you see that they could do that and be successful? TJ, I know you want to hit this. Well, one first, first, go first, uh, first of all, uh, we are so we were kind of sold a bill of goods uh, during camp. So first of all, there was a lot of hype around Orgy, and not mm-hmm. only were like it wasn't just 
things leaking from practice, every single insider, every single uh, journalist who was getting, because we are, I don't know about USC, how they do practice during fall camp, but it is closed off to anybody. Uh, at, at, no one can see anything at camp uh, for Michigan. So there, there was a lot of hype out of Alex Orgy uh, looking more polished as a passer, going through his progressions, more comfortable in the pocket. Uh, and, and the word was out of camp all the way up until the final week that Alex Orgy was QB1. And then uh, then the word is Davis Warren had an, like an, an astounding final week of camp, 80% completion percentage, um, like 87% is like the actual figure. And he just looked amazing, and he stole the job. That was the word mm-hmm. out of Ann Arbor is he stole the job. So they made him QB1. They made Davis Warren QB1. And it's like, well, and, and then the word, and then like the speculation or the, you know, the smoke was, well, it wasn't that Alex Orgy lost the job. Alex Orgy played really well. Davis Warren just overtook it, right? But then we saw during the game, Tim and Matt, the way they were utilizing Orgy, it looked like they don't trust him. So we're very skeptical. As a fan base, we are all skeptical. Like There's optimism because going into the season, we believe that Alex Orgy, many people in the Michigan community, of course, you have your side. Some people are Team Tuttle or Team Warren. But going into the year, majority of us wanted to see Alex Orgy because we think he gives us the highest ceiling because we saw him actually perform very well in spring ball. And he, he showed his dual uh, capabilities, and he was actually uh, was throwing at a 70% clip. He looked pretty good. But when he gets into games, the way the coaching staff utilized him, it almost was like they were afraid to call any passing plays. And then he did have one play where he rolled out to the right, and he completely threw the ball, and it went to the dirt like five feet away from the receiver. So it was very, and then we were like, oh, okay, there's a problem here. So we are, I think as a fan base, we are cautiously optimistic because we believe in the theory of Alex Orgy, but we have not seen it uh, come to light yet. And I'll tell you this though, Tim and Matt, if he was truly the guy, he would have started week one. There's a yep. reason it's week. It, there's a reason it's week four, big 10. Play. At least we hope. At least we hope that they have enough of an ability to evaluate. Yeah. That well, that uh, and they're and yeah. they're putting the right conditions in practice, and we're we're taking that a little bit on faith, um, because yes. of what they did last year. And but we need to remember that number one, a lot of coaches are now playing in are, are now in the NFL, either at the Chargers, the Seahawks. Uh, I think there's one somewhere else. But they're in the. A lot of them went to the NFL, and some of the the key talent on the offense also did, but. I'm talking about coaches because they ha- they create the scenarios in practice where these quarterbacks are going up against the ones, the twos, three, and they, they come up with all of these things in, in the various uh, days of practice and what drills do they work on and all that kind of stuff. So um, so I'm, I'm a little concerned at their ability. I'm, I'm going to just say it. I'm a little concerned right now in their ability to pick the guy. And I wasn't, right. you know, before this season, but but I know what – I know that Alex Orgy, if nothing else, let's say he throws half of his passes into the freaking dirt. Okay. He's not giving them to the other team. That's good. Okay. He's not, uh, and he's running the ball. So, so I think, um, you know, let, let's see what they can draw up, but at the very least, I think he's going to do better. I, at least I hope than three picks and, uh, knock on wood. I'm knocking on the wood, uh, right now. Uh, but, uh, but we'll see. I do want to get to three super chats. If you don't mind guys. Uh, Blue Wolverine 999. I really enjoy the mixed panels. We do too, Blue. And we also thank you because, Blue, you have been really awesome on our show. I know Cliff and Mac and, and others like you, you have been out there and we really appreciate you. And that's why you have an emoji. Can everybody drop the blue? If you're a member, you can drop the Blue Wolverine emoji in chat right now. Uh, thank you so much for your 999. Uh, GT. Uh, five bucks here. I think Michigan has to keep USC around 20 points in order to win this game, which is a pretty tall order. I would agree with you, GT. That is a pretty tall order, knowing the offensive, the the abilities of Lincoln Riley to play call for Miller Moss, which I commented. Remember in the bowl game, I said, wait a minute. It seems like he's actually calling plays better for Miller Moss than he did at times for Caleb. Like it just seems to flow so much better with Miller Moss for some reason. Um, so, so I guess, you know, I, I'd love to get your guys' take on that super chat. Like is, do you think that's the scenario that, that Michigan, Michigan has to keep USC to 20 points? Matt, I would say this, I think 20 is the number. If, if 
USC doesn't hand Michigan, you know, a defensive touchdown or special teams touchdown. And I think that really gets to the heart of this game on the most elemental central level. If Michigan has to work hard for all its points, meaning no defensive touchdowns, no special teams touchdowns, and it has to drive 70 or more yards every time, it doesn't get a short field, it doesn't get a, a kick return, any of that, USC probably wins. But, but if Michigan can get points from defense and special teams, like then the normal conventional wisdom, you know, how many points Michigan's going to need to hold USC to goes out the window. So really the 20 points holds, the 20 points is pretty much right if, if uh, USC does not hand, uh, get, hand deliver uh, any freebies to Michigan. Yeah, I, I'm I'm agreeing with Matt. I mean, I was gonna save this for our show late in about an hour or so, but I mean, since you got a super chat, I'll throw it out there. The keys to the game for me are ball security by SC. If USC takes care of the ball. You know, it's I, I think it might be pretty tough um, uh, for for Michigan to 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 win this game. I'm, I'm that's how I feel. Um, SC can't settle for field goals. SC has been sloppy in in, in, go, in the red zone with penalties, drop balls. And ended up costing about 10 points against LSU. They can't do that because points can be a premium. This, I mean, everyone's writing off, not, not everyone. There are many people in the nation writing off Michigan's defense, and, and they're crazy. This is a solid defense. It's going to test USC. And then the last thing's penalties. Like Matt just said, we can't let we can't help out Michigan's offense by extending plays with dumb penalties and vice versa. We can't make dumb dumb mistakes against a good defense. Uh, ending drives on offense. So if SC plays a clean, the, the basic is if SC plays a clean game um, and they score, you know, more than 20 points, I would find it very difficult for Michigan to win this game, in my opinion. Okay. TJ? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think if we can hold USC to 20 points, then that's definitely a path to victory. And I agree with uh, Tim here, where if USC plays a clean game, no turnovers, no bad penalties, um, I do find it a far uh, more steeper climb for Michigan to get this victory, given what we've seen. Now, hopefully week four, we see a team going into Big Ten play who's extremely motivated with a fire under their ass because they have a lot to prove. You know, they know. I mean, they know in the locker room. They know what's being said. So, you know, it's on them to step up this week and really make a statement to the world because this is going to be a primetime game here. Like, everyone's, everyone's going to be watching USC Michigan. You know what I mean? So, uh, we're looking at uh, – a heavyweight matchup in, in in theory we'll see if michigan comes to the plate i mean I, i'm more i'm less concerned about us well i'm concerned about usc but for this to be the heavyweight matchup we think it it, it has the potential to be i think usc is coming to play i just hope michigan is as well that's the concern because we've because we have seen michigan unfortunately falter uh, to another uh, elite juggernaut in college football right now and that's texas so but i think if, if michigan can hold them to 20 we have a great opportunity to get the victory yeah, that that uh, that that word if if Michigan can hold USC to twenty, that word if is doing a lot of lifting, um, given yeah. what Miller Moss is able to do. Um, and there was a comment I think from a USC fan earlier that said, "Watch out for USC's tight ends," because everybody always talks about the the wide receiver talent, and of course we all know that Lincoln Riley can coach. You know, he he can get quarterbacks coached up to a very elite level and we know that the wide receiver talents there but i thought that comment was extremely interesting because i don't right. normally think usc tight ends um but it but th but that comment was in there and I, I would love to just hear uh your take on that like you know how does miller moss need to feed the uh the receivers and the tight ends here to uh to to win in the pass game let me go matt sure um, in the past game, yeah, it's, it's, well, you saw two things you saw, um, especially in the, in the game, um, where you have both of when you have, they've been running the, with the run game. They've been putting in, they're doing two. It's not, it's not 12 personnel because you have Lake McCree lined up in the backfield. Really? It's like a 21 on, and then you got an H back, um, uh, depending on who it's, you know, it's going to be, uh, slot out. So they're using that to run, but as a whole, um, you saw if you drop your safeties back, 
Miller will pick you apart over the middle, right? And this, he'll just drop it right in. And if you try to stack the line, their athlete, you know, Lake McCree has shown that, that he's athletic enough to go out and make catches. Yeah, I mean, recently, this is the most we've seen Riley use his tight ends. Late in Helton era, the, the tight ends just uh, disappeared. But, I mean, throughout history, USC's had solid um, tight end play. But as of recent, I would have to say, yeah, probably not. But if you have Eldridge and Lake McCree, uh, wow. now, that way they Look got lined up, it's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that's a, a tight end has the most receiving yards out of every personnel uh, on here. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's definitely um, something I wasn't expecting and uh, and and uh, really impressive. One thing for me to add on, on all this is that, you know, if you watch that LSU game closely, USC did a lot of wide receiver screens and like short hitch patterns, really quick stuff outside the numbers to give Miller Moss just some easy completions. You know, it was week one, was just get him into a rhythm, just easy pitch and catch. LSU began to really bite down on those wide receiver screens on the edges. And you saw USC then go to the tight end along the hash marks in the middle third of the field as the mid game adjustment to LSU biting down on the wide receiver screens. So it was, it was not like the, the first point of attack against LSU. It was an adjustment to LSU coming up hard on the outside, on the boundaries. So it's going to be interesting to see how Lincoln Riley, who, you know, he, he makes defenses account for the full width and uh, length of the field. And so how, whether the tight end is like his first attack point or whether it's an adjustment, you know, it's a secondary uh, attack point that, that, you know, flows from the first attack point, that's going to be a natural uh, uh, plot point uh, for this game in terms of uh, how USC goes at Michigan's defense. Uh, got a couple more super chats here. Uh, uh, Tim, prepare thyself for uh, Nick's dollar uh, ninety nine kamikazes as as he likes to do. Usually, it's to the Buckeyes. To be fair, okay, ninety nine percent of them are to the Buckeyes. Uh, but in this case, obviously with USC week, uh, Tim, you're ready to get whipped Saturday. USC is so soft. Wow, I don't think they're as That's soft a as third base Ryan Day. That's a 2023 thing. USC ain't soft no more. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, I think I really Nick's don't. been drinking too many of his own 199 <laughs> I think that's Nick's problem. And, you know, I'll tell you, Nick, a lot of people told us, not just LSU fans, but the national media, how soft we were and how LSU is going to run the ball down our throat. That was literally what people were saying. And you know what? That's also what you guys said in 2007. I'm just gonna leave that right there as well. How they're gonna come out and beat the Surfer Boys? That didn't work out too well for your quarterback. Was Henny? I don't know if it was Henny. I can't remember yeah, who said this comment. So I mean, hey, look, you know what? Who knows? They play the game on the field. Maybe you guys will come take it to us. But history hasn't been kind to people that talk smack like that to USC. Rarely does Vegas move its opinion on anyone. It takes a lot for Vegas to move its opinion and the entire off season has been Michigan's going to maintain elite status. USC is kind of a wild card. They're on the fringe of the top 25. Sure. There's talent. There's Lincoln Riley. There's all these components. We, we are not sure about, but Michigan is this stalwart, this rock solid team that's coming into the season to contend again in the big 10. And sure. We're going to see mass movements down deep into the season, but we're only into week three and the position on pundits, Vegas, everyone has completely flip-flopped on these two teams from Michigan being uh, probably a 7 to 10-point favorite in the offseason to USC pushing over a touchdown favorite on Saturday, Matt. that That's pretty shocking. Not, not that USC's favored, but pushing a touchdown. Because I saw, uh, like a week ago, uh, FanDuel had a early line of two and a half. So like that, that's just insane line movement uh, just within the course of a week that that's being bet all the way up. And um, I think that, you know, I didn't mention this on the Michigan show. I guess I'm saving this <laughs> for the USC show. No, that's not really true, but just the thought came, comes to mind now. I, I should have thought about it on the, on the Michigan show with John and, and TJ, but you know, Lincoln Riley, when he was at Oklahoma, remember uh, the, the game against Ohio State? Uh, I believe that was a week three game in the middle of September. So, you know, 
you don't empty the kitchen sink in week one or week two. Keep a few things under wraps. Lincoln Riley ran rings around Ohio State, middle, second half of that game in Columbus, you know, the one with Baker Mayfield uh, planting his flag on the turf in, in Ohio Stadium in the horseshoe. And the thought does occur to me, Lincoln Riley's sitting on a lot of goodies. Uh, and he's had two weeks to prepare for this game. So like that, that certainly is a reason for USC fans to feel optimistic that there's going to be things that Wink Martindale uh, and the Michigan defensive staff have not seen on film. You, you, you got to think that Lincoln Riley is going to be setting up some, some, some plays, not just keeping them under wraps for the game, but also he's going to do things in the first quarter that are going to set things up for late second, early third, uh, quarter. So, you know, it's going to going to be see going to be fun to see what Lincoln Riley does in terms of manipulating the Manich- the Michigan defense in this game. I think it would be fun for me to ask TJ uh how is USC going to win this game and ask Tim how is Michigan going to win this game. Well, the way uh USC can win this game is if they, they show up. Ha uh, yeah, no, uh, the way they can win is stop the run. If they are able to suppress uh, Michigan's ability to run the ball and they get Michigan to uh, have some three and outs or uh, short drives, uh, one, that's going to completely disrupt the offense. And then secondly, our defense is going to be on the field. Uh, they're going to be overexhausted, overworked. We saw this against Texas. Texas was able to achieve this by the second quarter uh, because Michigan won couldn't get off on third down and then we were having an off offensive issues where we could not sustain drives so do not allow Michigan to sustain drives stop the run uh and then capitalize on your offensive opportunities and, and we talked about this previously on, on, on the show I was on but uh if they can score touchdowns and not resort to field goals then it's gonna be a long day for Michigan so before we let Tim go on this one one other side note to that is obviously the uh, wild card status of an Alex orgy in regards to what is he going to bring to the offense? We know he's not a thrower, so we're not expecting, you know, Drew Bledsoe esque type style quarterbacking out of Alex orgy. We know what his strengths are, but at the same time, there could be an advantage there in on the Michigan side that there's nothing on tape about Alex orgy other than him taking a direct snap and running with it. A little bit more than that. They've they've thrown him a few times, some some intermediate or not even intermediate, some stuff in the flat. But TJ, you are about as well equipped to answer this question as anybody I know. What would you do with Alex Orgy? How much you would let's say it's a competitive game. You know, you're you can't just trample them up front and just run the ball at will. So you gotta mix in the pass, you gotta be balanced like. What can we expect out of Alex Orgy in terms of being a downfield throwing threat? Well, Alex Orgy does have the capability to do short and intermediate passes. We have actually seen this. I mean, we saw this in the spring game. He was at a 70% clip against our defense. He looked good enough. He looked uh, capable at throwing these passes. So what what they need to do with Alex Orgy is, one, they need to uh, definitely scheme the playbook to his strengths. And by doing that, I believe some RPOs, some play action, rolling out to the right. I'm not too sure how he is rolling out to the left because the sample size is so small. I don't know his capabilities there. I actually am not overly confident with that. But I do believe if they can establish that along with a uh, an effective run game, that should keep USC honest. Now, you will need to do the occasional deep shot. And we do have some players that you can do it with. We have Fred Moore. We have Samaj Morgan. These are players and another player that they started on, on rap uh, against uh, – uh, Arkansas State, which is uh, a Marion Walker, who is a uh, he might be a four three guy. He has last year he was tested to have the highest three cone drill, and he would have had the number one score in the NFL Combine. That's how athletically gifted he is. He's a six four wide receiver. Uh, we got him out of Ole Miss. Uh, he transferred from Ole Miss, so he's extremely gifted athlete. His problem is he's still learning the position. He's a little raw, but you may see they may we may see him out there to try and at least maybe be a diversion, uh, keeping USC a little honest, uh, spreading the spreading the field a little bit. Uh, but the way that they need to capitalize on Alex Orgy is these quick pass options uh, that should uh, uh, achieve a high completion percentage or at least a, a higher percentage of a successful play. 
Tim, if you were scheming for Michigan against USC, what would you do? Well, on, on defense, USC has shown um, that that they they've had some trouble on on the line and pass protection. That's why I think it's important for USC uh, to to be able to run the ball uh, and play and play balanced there. USC. So if they could try to limit, like like TJ was saying, try to limit our run game, try to make us throw, and then allow uh, you know guys um, to come at USC and, and to attack SC. You know, have like um, Grant, Grant, Graham, and Stewart come at USC and get a a pass rush. That's really where it's gonna happen because USC's had some issues with ball security, and we've lucked out. I mean. You know the ball. The ball is shaped funny for a reason, and sometimes it bounces the right way, and it's bounced the right way for USC. Um, if USC doesn't play a clean game, and and they're able to frustrate us in the run game and get a pass rush. That's that's Michigan's best. They're not they're not going to win on offense, but they sure could make it difficult on defense. So that's that's really where this game will just be decided for Michigan. Uh, for Michigan. Well, I'll add to that, like. The thing for Michigan right now is getting pressure on the quarterback. We were we got one sack on Arkansas State, and they were down an offensive lineman. We got zero sacks against Texas. Now, granted, it's arguably the best offensive line in the nation, but even so, Michigan's defensive line should be able, uh, considering they have two potential first-round picks on that defensive line, they should be able to get pressure. We've also seen this year that has been a little concerning, a lack of push up the middle with Kenneth Grant and Mason Graham. And we're also wondering – where is the creativity on defense? Because we are not seeing creativity with blitz packages or disguises on the back end with coverage disguises like we're used to seeing with uh, Jesse Minter and Mike McDonald. So there are concerns on our end. Now, hopefully they get these things corrected. And by week four, uh, by this game this Saturday, that these things will be more polished. We'll see. But these are concerns so far entering the season. You know, um, that's TJ. I was going to ask you this. It made me think about when I was actually on the show with you earlier. Um, I have my my thoughts on it, but but who do you think this team misses more, Jesse Minter or Jim Harbaugh? It's probably Jim Harbaugh. I mean, I, I granted, I mean, Jesse Minter's was an upgrade over Mike McDonald, which is saying a lot. We're seeing that in the NFL right now. I mean, the the Chargers defense looks great. Seattle, I mean, these dudes are translating to the NFL. These are NFL caliber coordinators and coaches. Um, but Harbaugh's as quirky as he is, as unique as he is, he is just an excellent football coach and he keeps a program strong. Uh, and you can't, it is, there's a reason why he's already 2 0 with the Chargers. You know, he's just uh, an excellent Jeff football coach. I'm, kidding. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, JK Dobbins, maybe. But yeah, no, I understand. But like, no, I mean, he's just a great coach. I mean, and here's the thing too if Jim Harbaugh was the head coach, I would assure you we would have had a, a probably a better replacement at coordinator than Wink Martindale. Hmm. Well, we'll see. It's still to be determined. It's early in the year. We'll see what we can do. All right, Tim. You were more optimistic about SE season than either Matt or I, although I don't think either one of us are surprised. Uh, they beat LSU. I picked them to win that game. Um, they then, but, but they, they won it impressively. They also didn't just slop through Utah State. They did what an elite team does. They stomped them, and they shut them out on defense to further confirm the defensive improvement. And now they haven't played Michigan yet, but they look in position to be the better team and be a decided favorite. Could you have envisioned this is just about as good as it could be entering week three, uh, not just for USC, but the circumstances of this game that Michigan is apparently off of its game. It is a combination of both those things, really. Um, I'm a bit surprised. I, I, I'm, I'd be lying if I, if I said that I thought that this t this defense would look this good. I, I'm, I'm beyond impressed with uh, the just because of the turnaround. But as far as USC being in a position as in, the reason why I was bullish on USC and I said it, I don't know how many times going back, even to when we had a defensive coordinator that I didn't really feel confidence for. I kept saying that, and I said a lot in the summer because. Nobody was really believing it. They talked about it for years. They said, what if Lincoln Riley had a decent defensive coordinator? And one of the I did know is that we'd have a decent defense. So why was I so high on USC? It was because I knew we had a decent defense coming in. 
And and I know you just Lincoln Riley is the best play caller in football, in college football, definitely. And you you put him with a competent defensive coordinator. We saw what he did, you know. So then say, well, can you do it one year? Well, we saw what he did at UCLA, turning a program that was horrific on defense and turning them into one of the better run defenses in the country and one of the better overall defenses in the country. We saw it firsthand as Trojan fans, the way he he basically shut out Lincoln Riley. And Lincoln Riley looked at that and says, if you could do that to my offense, I want you as my defensive coordinator. And they went across town and they grabbed him. And I didn't think Michigan would be struggling the way it is. Again, I'm so surprised. Maybe I'm just like, maybe I just spoil being a USC fan. Because no matter how bad we are, we always have a great quarterback. I, it doesn't matter how bad we are on other parts yeah. of, of the field. For some reason, USC always has an elite level quarterback, no, no matter how bad we try to shoot ourselves in the foot in other parts of the program. And so you add that to Lincoln Riley, bring in a de- competent defense. These guys are playing out of their minds. They're, I think they're playing, they're all very talented, but they're playing, it's just a message. They seem very keyed in. Every interview I've been a part of and around, these guys are just singular focus. We don't care about the outside noise. You know, some of it's coach speak, some of it's being coached up by the sports information, you know, on how to talk and how to talk to the, this press. But they, these kids believe it. And I think that they screwed up, they being the rest of the country, taking shots at, at, at um, Lincoln Riley, embarrassing Lincoln Riley and embarrassing these players. And, and now they're mad and, and they're coming back for it. So I'm, I'm glad to see it. I, I think the combination of USC's defense being as good as it is and the opponents that we thought was going to be a huge gauntlet to, to run through, looking mortal, if not staggered, uh, it has me really excited about what USC could do this year. There's another point to add here in all of this, and that is that you know USC against Utah State was supposed to be facing Spencer uh, Petrus, instead faced Bryson Barnes. Okay? Was supposed to face Davis Warren, now instead is going to be facing uh, Alex Orgy. Next week, supposed to face Tyler Van Dyke. Instead, we'll face Braden Locke. So USC is going to have a run of three straight games in which a team is going to change its starting quarterback. Now, in two of the three cases, it's injury. In one of the three cases, it's a it's a choice by the coaching staff. But nevertheless, USC is running into a, quite the series of plot twists uh, with opposing quarterbacks. It's pretty fascinating to contemplate that. And that's just one month, not even a full, not even half a season, let alone a full season. And the defense is still, the, they talked about the offseason. They're, they're, the way that he's been successful at UCLA, uh, he being Danton Lynn, has been successful at UCLA. And now appears to have it turned around here at USC and, and with great momentum is the fact that he installed it and, and they just would nail parts of the offense. You don't throw the whole gigantic playbook at them. They're getting the stuff down, the fundamentals, and he's adding stuff every week. So this defense, just like in any install, is going to get better every week the more they get familiar with, with the scheme. And, and Miller Moss, I, I'm, I'm saying it again, Miller Moss is special. He's going to keep getting better every single, every single week, every rep at practice, every time he throws the ball or, or, or takes a snap in the game the young man's going to get better and better. And he's, he's so far, he's shown he's got ice water. He's taking some hits. We need to protect him. That's the key to the season is he's got to stop taking those hits um, because, you know, it's football. Do you think Miller Moss uh, stays uh, after the year? That's a question for him, his agent, and his family. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't know if you guys had a pulse you on know? Okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's, it's early, but I mean, he keeps playing like this. I doubt it. Okay. You know what, TJ? I would say this. Let's check in after the Michigan game. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. No, I, I think his stock will go up throughout the year. Uh, that's that. Yeah. That's what I will say. Now I'll, I'll make that prediction. I don't think that it's it's not. I think it's gonna be a situation of, um, you know, I can't imagine it, it getting much better than if if, if he continues to play the way he's playing right now. I can't imagine his stock going up, staying for a senior year. I think it would be really they, he's shown what he can do, and then now he just has to go to the next level. Would be my guess, but. I mean, obviously that's the I mean, decision it, they're going to make. You know, it's potentially possible you guys make a good run here in the playoffs and maybe he wants, uh, you know, he's he got to taste the playoffs and, you know, maybe with a nice NIL package, he could return for a uh, a redemption tour. You know, kind of like yeah. Quinn Ewers is uh, going through. JJ went through it. Uh, we'll see. I mean, obviously to be determined, but it's, it's a long way away. Yeah. 
let's, let's I mean, you guys are looking like a playoff team, though. I mean, you got to be feeling, I mean, maybe you guys are being cautiously optimistic, but, you know, from an outsider's perspective, you guys look like a playoff team. I think they look like a complete team, and I think they've got playmakers and they've got elite coaching. That's a, that's a good combination for a playoff team. I, I agree yeah. with you, TJ.